Any questions on what we've covered so far? So, you see, it's very straightforward to get to Mars. Uh, the, uh, for those of you who want to know what you can do about space exploration, I don't know if you understand this little thing, uh, you should join the Planetary Society, <laughs> of which I am the CEO. And this was something that happened, I think, through a series of clerical errors. First of all, I, as you may know, through a, a major accident, I was admitted to Cornell University, and then through some lack, something going wrong in the, in the curriculum department, I had one class from Carl Sagan. I joined the Planetary Society in 1980 when Carl Sagan felt that, and two other guys, Bruce Murray, who was the head of the Jet Propulsion Lab during the Voyager missions and Viking missions, and Lou Friedman, who was a celestial mechanician there, uh, thought that public interest in space exploration was very high, but uh, government support of it maybe not so much. So I am happy to say, if anybody is a member of the Planetary Society, that we believe the NASA budget will be increased for the first time in, a, in many, many years. So uh, the future is bright for planetary exploration. Uh, and I think the Planetary Society can take full credit. I think that's, <laughs> no, we, uh, we have the big thing we do, we, we educate, we have outstanding journalists, bloggers, and we create, we made our own spacecraft last year, which was very cool. Uh, solar sail, and then the other thing we do is advocate. We have uh, political analysts who go to Washington, D.C., and as they say, Washington's a small town based on relationships. It's just, just like Hollywood. <laughs> and uh, you uh, develop, it brings together people, I mean, it's amazing, the different political people that come together to support space. So with that said, uh, from, uh, for a long time, from the White House Office of Science and Technology, uh, Sec Science and Technology Policy, the uh, OSTP. <laughs> no, it is, the uh, Deputy Director of Technology and Innovation. He was the chair of the Global Health Working Group for the Clinton Global Initiative, a senior fellow with the Center for American Progress, where he co-authored a national innovation agenda, and he served on three committees of the National Academy of Sciences, including the Committee to Facilitate Interdisciplinary Research. Give it up for Tom Khalil. Tom. Great to see you, sir. Great to see you. A long-time acquaintance. And then an associate professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at my beloved Cornell <laughs> University, in addition to sharing my alma mater, he was NASA's chief technologist the head of the Science Technology Mission Directorate, for those acronym buffs out there. From 2012 to 2014, Dr. Mason Peck. Good to see you, man, great to see you. And then the Director for, Center for, Bit, for the Center for Bits and Atoms at a uh, university that doesn't even need a name, it's just an acronym at MIT best known as a pioneer in personal fabrication. The small-scale manufacturing enabled by digital technologies would give people like you and me the tools to build literally anything they can imagine. His fab lab at MIT is very famous. Here's Neil Gershenfeld. Neil, great to see you. And filling out our panel is uh, the CTO, Chief Technology Officer of Drawbridge Health Incorporated. She was a Senate staffer on the Energy Committee. Has, uh, she worked at DARPA, where she created a transformative, transformative biotechnologies to solve intractable problems. How hard could that be? <laughs> and like so many people, has her PhD from MIT. <laughs> Dr. Alicia Jackson. Alicia, thank you. We're going to talk about a permanent human presence on Mars. Very straightforward. And uh, I just want to start by pointing out that everybody, it is very reasonable that we all are here at a time when life is discovered on another world. And that I just want to emphasize that that would be profound. 
that would change the course of human history. It would change the way everybody feels about being a living thing in the cosmos. And so naturally, humankind being what it is, what they are, uh, humankind, which apparently included my old boss. It's a few times I wasn't sure. Uh, if humankind is aware of this, we're naturally going to go to Mars. So uh, we are exploring Mars right now with robots. So I'd like to start with Mason. How is uh, robotic exploration enabling the eventual human presence on Mars? It's a great question because I think we, um, we often conflate uh, the science and exploration goals a little bit. Um, there are scientists who are interested in discovering the nature of things. Uh, technologists interested in creating things that have never existed or haven't existed yet. Um, when robots have shown us the way, we'll have a better idea of how to put humans on Mars. These right? are robots built by people, though. Um, That's right. So, uh, but when, when we build robotic systems, though, we are building them, and I guess Jennifer Trosper can attest to this, we are building them as exquisitely as we can, to be as reliable as we can. There's a lot at stake. A lot of science is at stake. When we have people on Mars, uh, we're going to need to embrace a different paradigm. It's a paradigm in which people can solve problems, whether it's uh, you know, fixing your own habitat or growing your potatoes. Uh, <laughs> th those, those will be things that robots don't do, they will never do. And so it is about science, uh, having people on Mars, but it's also about uh, the kind of innovation and creativity that people can bring to the problem. So have you worked on the MOXIE instrument? Is any, this is the Mars oxygen in situ experiment. You know, the word I stands for in situ. Okay, so it'd be making oxygen on the Martian surface, yeah? Yeah, so uh, one of those uh, features of future exploration systems, we think, is this so-called in situ resource utilization. So in situ means in place. The ISRU, is, ISRU. ISRU, there you go. I know you have a passion for acronyms, Bill, so we're trying to <laughs> do what we can. So the idea with uh, this ISRU stuff is we need to learn to live off the land. But right now, um, here, here's a secret you might not know. All the mass we're ever going to need to explore the solar system and even permanently settle a planet, it's already up there. It's just in the wrong shape. <laughs> right? So we need to learn how to form our own exploration hardware, our own science hardware, from what we find in place. Whether that's water for people to drink or grow crops uh, or to turn into rocket fuel, uh, other material to turn into objects, which I'm sure Neil will talk about, um, that step of using those resources ends our reliance on Earth as the source for all this mass that we launch with all of its cost. And the reason that that is so expensive is... Um, How expensive is it, by it's the way? It's easily tens of thousands of dollars a kilogram. So, th so that's one thing. So it's very expensive that's, to send... That's more to expensive than gold. Yes. So it's expensive to send things. And then if we are sending a rocket, a very large percentage of that could be fuel. So, you know, 95% or more of that could be fuel. So you would, right now, uh, as Mason said, all of the matter and energy that we're using in space comes from Earth. And in the future, we would like it to be the case that um, uh, all or virtually all of the matter and energy that we're using in space is, is coming from space. And we might start with simple things like fuel and food and building Oh, materials. yeah, those are simple, yeah. Uh, but, you know, over the next 50 to 100 Get years, solid rocks and make them into food. Yeah. Uh, sure. Over the next 50 to... Uh -huh. You know, uh, if we think about a longer time horizon, uh, and that's where I think Neil and, and Alicia can come in, is the diversity and sophistication of what it is that we can make in space is going to increase over time. So, everybody, you're, we are constrained right now by what's called the beer can problem. Uh, the mass of a, of a jet airplane uh, is about 10% fuel at takeoff. A rocket is about 90% fuel, maybe more than that. And so it's, it's a, akin or analogous to the amount of liquid in a soda or a beer can compared with the mass or weight of the can. And it's just, it's out of your everyday experience how much fuel it takes to get into orbit or on orbit and then beyond that. But you're gonna make machines that are gonna do this. Yeah, Neil? Uh, yes. So could I ask? Um, there's a graphic I'd like to put up, if I, and I'd like to take just a couple minutes. So I want to talk about how to go to Mars without luggage. Um, so I've made a teleporter. 
Um, but it has a catch. Uh, I can teleport anything as long as it's a nuclear spin, and they don't make good astronauts. <laughs> so I wouldn't hold my breath for the teleporter, but what I wanna talk about now is how to make the replicator. The replicator we will make, and it will change how we go to Mars. Now, I know it's in space, but what's, what's the sound effect? Oh. Is it <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's good, that's good. Um, so I'm going to take just a couple minutes to tell how to make a replicator. So on the left is a wonderful book, series of books by Dave Gingery, where you start with a charcoal furnace and you end with a machine shop. <laughs> Lovely books, and largely that's how people think about going to Mars, and it's wrong. It's, it's recreating the Industrial Revolution. Um, so in, in biology, there's a mistaken notion called ontogeny rec recapitulates phylogeny, which means biology repeats all of history to make something new. And that's not how biology works. So advanced manufacturing today is like 3D printing. That's actually decades old. MIT made the first computer-controlled milling machine in the 50s. What interests me is an invention that's four billion years old. That's the evolutionary age of the ribosome, which is the molecule that makes molecules. And the important thing to know is, and Alicia will talk more about this, I'm sure, is it's digital. It runs a program where the code doesn't just describe the thing, the code becomes the thing. So what I'm showing at the top is, to do what I'm doing now, I'm full of molecular machines. There's motors that move my arms, there's synapses in my brain, detectors for me to smell you. Um, the amazing machines, and they're all made from 20 parts. And those 20 parts, what's amazing about them is they're not amazing. One is hydrophobic, one is hydrophilic, one is basic, one is acidic. They're very unremarkable. But with just those 20 parts, you make all of you with your enormous complexity. And because they're coded, it's both the diversity but the complexity. You can DNA corrects error to a part in 10 to the 8. So what I'm showing below that is we're now developing what look like amino acids but for engineering. So with conducting and insulating nanobricks, we can make circuits. With a resistive brick, we can make all the passive components. DigiKey, the electronic vendor I use, sells 500,000 resistor types. I can make them from three parts. With um, semiconducting parts, a couple more, we can make integrated circuits. And about 20 parts lets us create modern technology. So on the left, on hey, the bottom, I'm showing assemblers. Where, where do I get uh, an amino acid? Um, what is it? Uh, eat lunch. All right, so it's coming yeah, up. Yeah, that's good, you'll, you'll be fine. But so now to build up, biology has hierarchy. It goes through primary, secondary, tertiary structure. What I'm showing on the right is nano building blocks assembled into micro building blocks. And then a student now at NASA, Kenny Chung, showed that by linking loops of carbon fiber, little tiny parts, he set the world record for the highest performance ultralight material, which means instead of having a tool the size of a spaceship to make the spaceship like the ribosome, you have a little assembler make something big. We're now working with NASA on doing that on the scale of space scale structures. And to tie all this together, finally at the bottom, what I'm showing, where this really gets interesting. Yeah, is this has been nothing, so very routine. Yeah, so, but uh, uh, I'll make it worthwhile, is designs for assemblers that assemble assemblers. So now we have assemblers made out of the parts they assemble. The ribosome is slow. It assembles one amino acid a second, but you can make an elephant that way because ribosomes make ribosomes. So what we're learning how to do is make assemblers that make assemblers. And so what that then means is to go to Mars, you, you don't go mining for 500,000 resistor types. You need about 20 parts and then you code the construction, and, and this is really how life emerged, and it's sort of the engineering equivalent of the emergence of life, and that's the roadmap to the replicator. It's not digitizing the design, it's actually digitizing the materials and the information. Very cool. How, let me ask you this uh, charming question, you know, apocalyptic science fiction. Uh, what evolution has is a way to correct itself. So uh, does this, does your system, which is, I guess will be ready in a couple weeks, uh, <laughs> does it have that sorted out kind of uh, charm, uh, feature? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of scary things you could worry about. Um, well, we have the planetary protection officer. The drill bit's been on Mars for three and a half years in the most sterilizing environment you can imagine, and no, Maybe the rear wheel's in a puddle of water. No, it isn't. 
for Christ. Sorry, I digress. In other words, people are scared of stuff, so take it. So to, l let me tell you two different things you, you could be scared about, but why you shouldn't. All right. You can worry about other stuff. Um, one is these need feedstocks that are not natural. And so for these to function autonomously. What's out an unnatural feedstock? Um, pure silicon. Um, but it occurs so, in nature. But um, you, you, would, uh, you need, so to come up to why you shouldn't be scared, if you did all the stuff for all this, stay with me, for all this to function independently in a natural environment, what you would need to do is everything I said with natural feedstocks autonomously, and what you would have done is reinvented biology. All I'm describing is what biology does. This is synthetic biology. Right. All I'm doing is describing biology, and, and bio-warfare is a serious concern, and maybe Alicia will talk to that, but this is no different than that. Um, the distinction is we're extending biology into materials that aren't available to biology, but this is no more or less scary than the threat of biology today. But more than that, I've set up early versions, not of the assembler, but of these labs in war zones, in places of, of sectarian conflict. And over and over, we found something really interesting, which is hurting people is a well-met market need. <laughs> you, you don't need new tools to hurt people. I'm sure I could go out to a street corner and wave my hand and somebody would sell a gun. What we find is th these haven't been used to do scary things because the people who want to do scary things already have really good ways to do scary things. They're used to do something else. I'm talking about the accidental something or other. But again, f for, for this to run wild in nature with unchecked replication means it would need to turn solar energy into stored energy. It would need to harvest naturally available materials in a self-reproducing system. And what, again, you can think about all of this as not reverse. It's sort of forward engineering biology. We're just catching up to what biology does. It's no different than the threats of biology today, which are real. We're just extending it to materials that don't exist in biology, like semiconductors and think carbon fiber. And well, actually, carbon fiber does. So this is, uh, Alicia, your chime in in a moment. But this is the, my anti-concern about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and computers taking over the world and killing everyone is cool as long as the, somebody's shoveling coal to make the electricity. As soon as you unplug them, like <laughs> it's, it's over with. So with that said, uh, we're going to go to Mars. You're going to build, you're going to take um, um, iron oxide from the rocks, and you're going to make some cool stuff. And then... Uh, we're going to do all kinds of other innovation to survive. So really, the heart, again, the heart of it, transitioning to Alicia, is we don't need to go to Mars and find a zillion different things. We need to find about 20 things and make modular forms of those 20 things. And that's how you build exponential complexity for a civilization. OK. There. <laughs> 20 things. 20 things. Get some how, research. How hard could it be, right? Yeah. Exactly. For the planet, the, by the way, planetary science budget for the first time in many years is now over one and a half billion. One and a half billion will sort of get you through the morning. Yes, one and a half billion will get you through the morning. And as good as that is, let's remember NASA's budget still only represents less than one half of 1%. It's 0.4%. So just to throw a couple numbers around. During the Apollo era, which I lived through, <laughs> there were the NASA budget was four percent of the federal budget. Now it's just about exactly 04 percent. So when people say if they can put a man on the moon, why can't they make a decent movie or whatever? Uh, uh, the reason is if you spent uh, two and a half, three times the the budget of the interstate highway system, you could do you could put people about anywhere you want. So anyway, Alicia, there we go. We're on Mars, self-replicating machines, take it. No problem. <laughs> um, so so uh, why, do we, why are we even talking about biology? And it's as Neil said, because it's, it's actually an information technology. All of us are programmed through the same thing, our DNA. And if we can figure out how to send the information to change that program, we can adapt our environments and we can adapt ourselves. And that's actually the direction I want to take it into, is we've talked a lot about how do we create this closed, self-renewing system. And luckily, we have, we have a proof point for that. It's called Earth. We have a self-closed, self-renewing system. And, and everything's going fine. 
here. Um, um, but I'm very interested in, in how do we adapt humans for that long journey and once they get there? How do we enable people not to lose muscle mass, not to lose bone density? How do we enable them to potentially see in other wavelengths? And all of this does sound like science fiction, but it's, it's not. There are several new technologies that came on board about three years ago, most notably CRISPR, that does allow you to very precisely go in and program your DNA to get CRISPR, CRISPR. CRISPR. Say that and you will be science whiz on the edge. Is it an acronym? It is. Uh, and the letters have significance? Uh, the letters have significance uh. clustered <laughs> regularly, interspace, self palindromic, palindromic repeats. repeats. CRISPR. What's the P? Palindromic. 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 Yes. Is anybody named Hannah? <laughs> <laughs> With an H on the end. Don't come running to me if you don't have that H. Uh, and Anna. An Anna? Okay, anybody named Lil? <laughs> All right, so there we are. You're gonna program a baby, a human baby? No, you could, you could program yourself. So instead of selecting for people who had these wild attributes, we could program you to be able to maintain your muscle mass, to have a longer lifespan, to be able to not get to depressed for being on a spaceship for 500 days, to synthesize your own but vitamin D. Can I ask a question, I think? Um, this is all much too much to carry this. Um, why don't we make like little people to go to Mars? <laughs> that exists. Are you, are you thinking about amputation? There's going to be limits. No, no, yeah. Just, just uh, editing the developmental yeah. program. You know, if you want, you know, th there's a lot of stuff I've evolved to do, like, you know, r running in jungles and fighting lions that doesn't help me going to Mars. And so you could repackage the whole deal. <laughs> so. Alicia, seriously, no, it's a if I can use that term seriously. Okay, you're gonna go, you wanna program, somebody wants to, we have an astronaut, it's an extraordinary athlete. Is any, has anybody applied to be an astronaut? Yeah, so are you, what did they I'm say? The current selection. Oh, right on. Hey, let's, hey, Alicia, best of luck. Wow, cool. That is cool. Blow it up, blow it up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and she has a PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and you, how many marathons have you run in round numbers? Not, not, none yet. Yeah. But the kind of what I'm saying is the kind of people that become astronauts nowadays are extraordinary. They're just these overachieving maniac, <laughs> wonderful people that have the ability to be cheerful in, the adver in adversity, one, and, and an attribute you, attribute you alluded to. So are you proposing that you program yourself? How do you do this? By inserting a virus in your DNA, of uh, some kind of carrier that like is, that? That is one way. You could imagine even modifying your Here, own. Get your mic a little closer. Oh, there we yeah. go. There we go. You could even imagine modifying your own blood cells. To, so you don't actually have to You might be able to DNA. imagine that. So how, does, how would that work? Seriously. You, you go in, you extract the DNA, you insert the genes that code for the attributes that you care about, you remove the genes that code for the attributes you don't care about. How do you do that? Genes are, I mean, these are on uh, DNA, which are small things, yeah? So a major revolution that's happened in the last um, 10 years or so is not only our ability to sequence the genome, I'm sure all of you know about that, but our ability to actually build genomes. And that's really a silent revolution that's been going on. The ability to synthesize DNA from nothing but, but simple chemistry. How do you do it? Is it uh, uh, tiny uh, vials? in ultraviolet light and stuff like that? How That's is it? exactly what it is. It's, yeah. it's super tiny vials, and what you do is you add the different bases, A, T, Cs, or Gs, and they just react with one another and you build it up. The trick has been is we, we didn't know what to write. We could read genomes, but we couldn't really translate them and understand what to write. And now what we're doing is we're just beginning to understand how to write really simple sentences. For example? For example, how do I cure my blindness? That is pretty cool. It's awesome. So somebody who is blind, genetically blind, yes. somehow, yes. not from a trauma, a mechanical yeah, trauma. Yeah, it can't be a nerve separate yeah. because of something in the, the eye. This person comes into your lab, yes. sits down with a, they do a stick, a, a, hemato a phlebotomist sticks a needle in the person's they, arm. They would stick it in your eye. Stick it, how relaxing. <laughs> stick it in your eye. <laughs> Carefully is presumed. And I'm also presuming these are these freaking tiny needles, yeah? And then what happens? 
it would basically go into all the cells of your eye and then fix whatever the issue is. Maybe it's just secreting a protein that you don't have that can be a receptor for light. Just a protein. Mm -hmm. so like, to like to relate it, uh, CRISPR is extremely similar to in your word processor, um, you have a search and replace function. Mm -hmm. You call up a little window and you search for something and replace it. And the amazing thing is CRISPR is a molecular machine that essentially does exactly that. You say, f find this and change it to that. Now, that does lead- And it came from studying the uh, bacterial immune system. So it wasn't like we were looking for this. We were just uh, studying how the immune system of, ba of bacteria worked. And then we discovered, hey, this is really technologically useful. But that's why it's important to support fundamental research because the, the history of innovation is, uh, is one of serendipity often. Now, if you do want to be scared, Fundamental research, people. So we just, okay, okay. Uh, what keeps the U.S. in the game economically is innovation. And innovation comes from investment in fundamental research. And so why people are opposed to this is just mystifying. With that said, yes, you, the, you poke this thing in the eye. <laughs> this machine, uh, this molecular machine, which goes by the acronym CRISPR, will selectively replace the defective or the protein missing cells with the protein. Yes. I mean, how reliable is this? How do you get every cell, every protein? Uh, that's one very key question. So you can do that with a virus. So it specifically targets the different cells in DNA. Viruses are, are amazing machines. We have, we have, many of you might have heard of the microbiome. Uh, for every human cell we have in our body, we have 10 to 100 microbes on our body doing all types of important functions for us. We're more, we're more bacteria than we are human. And then we also have the virome. So it turns out we have tons of viruses in our body that actually do mostly useful things. So it turns out human beings wouldn't be able to create placentas without a special viral sequence within them. And so viruses are amazing machines at targeting different cells and injecting their DNA and making humans basically bend them to their will. So it's not our robot overloads, it's our viral overloads that we're actually subject to. And so when will this technology emerge? It already is. There are several companies already in existence. Um, there's huge patent battles going on. It, it, rarely will you ever hear anyone say this, but it could be the most transformative thing that's happened, I'd say, in the last two decades. Uh, well, we just heard it. Uh, <laughs> well said. So this is an extraordinary time, everybody. I just remind you, it's, it's 2016. Uh, we believe that without increasing the NASA budget, uh, we could put humans in orbit around Mars, uh, with, except adjusting it for inflation. We could put, which is an increase, but one that you'd expect, wouldn't shock you, uh, put humans in orbit around Mars in 2033. So I'm looking around the room, I see a lot of young people here. Some of you could very well be on that, on one of those missions, and then you could hypothetically land on the moon Phobos, and study a lot of Mars, because Mars gets, uh, pieces of Mars end up on Phobos. And then uh, two or four years later, you could, one of you in the audience could be on the surface. You talk about transformative, and then you all, uh, your legacy will feed them and clothe them, and humankind will have a presence in the solar system. It's important to emphasize something, certainly for those kids who are afraid that they're gonna get their eyes poked out. Um, <laughs> I think that's not actually strictly necessary in the short term. This very well could be the vision for how we ultimately populate or settle the solar system. That may be the case. In the short term, there's some very straightforward things we can do, technologies we can invest in to make those Mars missions a reality. Prosaic things like uh, putting some depots for fuel between here and Mars so we can short circuit what's called the rocket equation. That is the need to carry the fuel to carry the fuel to get to Mars. Uh, same thing with uh, 3D printers on the surface. Rather than sending all the spare parts we need, send a few basic materials from which we can then repair our habitats, repair the uh, life support machines and so forth. These are relatively straightforward things that we can identify a path from today to tomorrow. And uh, so, you young people, um, you will be human, I think, when you go to Mars for the first time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, later on, maybe you'll have some strangely colored uh, descendants with uh, interesting eyeballs. But th those, um, <laughs> that's, that's a different future. That's a future that's uh, maybe farther off. Uh, the good I, news, though, I is disagree. the near term. I disagree. Well, I think it's not to say it's necessary. Closer. That's what I'm saying. I think we can actually, this is within our grasp right now, at least some early missions to Mars. Can I make a connection between this and why it's so important down here on Earth, which is 
The very same conversation we're having here, I also have with mayors of cities for almost exactly the same reason. All over the world, cities are broken. Barcelona has a 50% youth unemployment. A whole generation can't work. The economy is broken. Yet you leave home to do a job you don't want to do, making something for somebody you'll never see to get money, to then buy something made by somebody far away and then trash goes to the trash dump. And so there's this amazing connection between all the technology we've been talking this morning and a transition towards self-sufficient cities. A number of cities, starting with Barcelona and many other cities, are now signing up for the notion that atoms come and, uh, bits come and go, but the atoms stay. The cities can produce and consume everything in a closed cycle. And it's almost exactly the same as the Mars problem, but really reinventing. Rather than doing all that stuff to work, what if you could just make what you need? <laughs> And so there's a deep connection between sustainable economies on Earth and going to Mars. It's very true. I mean, historically, every time we've reached out and done something amazing, going to the moon, uh, building the space station, we've come back with dozens or even hundreds, maybe thousands of new technologies that benefit all of us. So it's not simply that having boots on Mars gives us better science. It's not simply the, the uh, encouraging feeling it gives us to experience these things. Those are all important. But let's remember that these things pay off. Uh, for all of us in the future in ways we probably can't even imagine. And if we want NASA to play a leadership role in this area, they need the funding to be able to support this long-term high-risk, uh, high-return research, whether it's uh, self-replicating robotic factories in space uh, or, or the applications of, of life sciences for space exploration. How about venture capital or philanthropic uh, contributions? Does that play a role? No, absolutely. We've already seen some billionaires uh, support some activities around SETI and things like that. And the reason they do it, everybody, the reason uh, philanthropists participate is, I think, uh, deep within us. First of all, space exploration brings out the best in us. It brings out the best in humankind. Uh, you're applying to be an astronaut, and I think you're consistent with that vision. Uh, this idea that we're going to send the best people to do the best work and deep within us, I claim, are two questions. Where did we come from, and are we alone? And if you want to answer in the universe, and if you want to answer those two questions, you have to explore space. So while we are working on the next rover mission, while we are uh, enjoying this remarkable uh, epic of science fiction stories that are inspiring all of us, uh, just remember that in the very near future, we may make discoveries through space exploration and innovations and technological uh, achievements that will utterly change the world, just as you su suggest in the next two decades. Thank you all very much. A hand for the panel. <laughs> so good to see you all. Say it again. Oh, Q&A. Oh, cool. My mistake. I thought with that, that you were cutting us off. Question and answer. Man in the front row, hit us. Stand up. Let them hear you outside. Blow the roof off the dump. All right. Uh, I was worried about the programming of the human body. I was wondering if we could be using that to take a step forward in the medicine, like a man who might have lost his arm in war, if we could find some way to be uh, re... whatever we're calling it back, or even taking that a step forward by giving us like inhuman qualities like extreme amounts of strength or able the ability to uh, hold our breath for inhuman amounts of time. He wants to know if he can be an X-Man. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That is that is an awesome question. You should you should go to DARPA and run programs there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This, that, that is the kind of vision we look for. Um, yeah, that's one of the main things we worked on when we were at DARPA. Because if you send, in, in many ways, sending a person to the moon or to Mars is similar to sending a service member a person in the military to a, a very desolate place. So how do you give them superhuman strength? How do you enable them to survive in this environment? How do you enable them to self-heal if they lose a finger or an arm or even more than that? Absolutely. So you're working on it. Working on it. Stay tuned. Uh, guy, man in hat. Yes. Stand up. <laughs> M Matt, stand up. Uh, terraforming. Terraforming. Will we be able to achieve it? And if you think we will, 
How long do you think it'll take? There are implications for planetary protection there, right? Alicia, um, go for it. Yes, yes. Um, it depends what kind of terraforming you're talking about. So you could imagine doing a very small system. So let's, let's think about creating kind of biosphere three or four, right, on Mars. It probably wouldn't have all the lush greenery that you would have. You, you may only need three or four organisms to create that closed self-renewing system. So some bacteria, um, some photosynthetic organisms, maybe a plant or two, and that's it. So it's, it's not going to be the lush tropical paradise you're thinking about. It'll probably be smelly. In fact, so I read a book where apparently NASA tried doing this about 20 or 30 years ago, and they, create, they put a man in with about two other organisms, and apparently when they opened it up after two weeks, the smell knocked them down. So <laughs> terraforming, paraterraforming, definitely within, within five to 10 years. Anything on the scale of creating something lifelike, much more challenging. That's decades, decades out. The analogy I always remind you is, how many people want to go live permanently in Antarctica? Not that many people. I mean, yes, we have a science outpost there with several dozen workers and scientists there all the time. But you don't go live there. I mean, imagine going there. Not only do you have to take all your own food and water, you have to take your own air. <laughs> I mean, you would notice that right away if you don't take your own air. <laughs> and so it's really uh, an extraordinary thing to say we're going to go colonize Mars. With that said, a human presence is something else. Yes, yes, please. So I think that there is a real value in having humanity establish 50 to 100 year goals. But I think in order to make it real for people, we have to just say, what are the intermediate milestones along the way? Um, so. Uh, so, for example, on the application of biology to space exploration, you might want to start up with the ability to have food uh, before you say we're going to, you know, terraform another planet. So, I, but I do think that there is a value to having some long-term uh, stretch goals that are in the, you know, 20, 30, 50 years out. And we haven't talked at all about the kind of economic forces that could also come into play. There may be some reason, I don't, want, don't know what it is, maybe some of you know, some reason why we need to be exploring for the sake of the economy, for small businesses, for large businesses, uh, for people to make their own kind of lives on Mars. Uh, there's other motivations in addition to science, in addition to purely exploration, uh, which we also can't conceive of right now. It may be that we'll discover that killer app that needs us to be in space. Uh, that can drive a future economy. Uh, if that's the case, uh, that also changes the conversation quite a bit. It might be that by embracing Mars in its current state, we actually get more out of it than turning it into another Earth. Uh, yeah, uh, just by way of example, uh, whether it's uh, um, uh, Magellan or Columbus or Lewis and Clark or Henry Hudson or uh, the British Navy that enabled the East India Company, the exploration Happen, is government funded at first. Like we've mapped Mars, for example. And then the commercial entities emerge. Let's get another question. Let's go farther in the back. Whoa, it's farther in the back. Uh, a guy over here, uh, dark shirt. Yes. Oh, back there. We'll go back there, then we'll come here to dark shirt. Yes, back there. Are any of you guys are working on being looked at for geoengineering models or work on this planet? Geoengineering. Anyone on it? <clears throat> so this is what I say, everybody. <laughs> this is what I say. Everybody wants to go to Mars. We're going to terraform Mars, and uh, Mr. Spock will be from there, and it will all emerge very quickly. So one thing that the president did announce is, is called mission innovation, and this is something that was announced in Paris in the climate discussions, which was the major funders of clean energy R&D, including the United States, but all these other countries as well, agreed to double the uh, investment in, in clean energy. So if we're gonna solve this problem, we have to figure out how to reduce greenhouse gases by 80% or, or more. Yeah, so there is something I would add to that. Through the White House, I ran a pop-up lab at the UN when the Sustainable Development Goals were launched, which was the biggest, biggest gathering of heads of state ever. And it's this 15-year roadmap for the planet of things like clean water and poverty and health care. And it was, I was there because the UN and White House wanted to show not just goals, but solutions. And it was an unusual thing because like the diplomats would look, look at us like, we don't see people like you around here. <laughs> Um, but what was interesting about it is if you go through the sustainable development goals, almost every single one of them rests not on policy, but on access to tools. 
and the tool builders weren't part of the conversation. And so right across the whole litany of the sustainable development goals, there's kind of this pivot. I was at another event with the UN humanitarian relief leader, and I was a dinner speaker, and she was really annoyed because she wanted to deal with refugee camps, and I was talking about tools. And then there's this great moment when she realized, wait a minute, refugee camps, no educational opportunity. Um, no entertainment, no economy, no infrastructure. She wanted to talk about all of those, and nobody was talking about the means to actually build infrastructure and solve local problems. So there is a really interesting pivot with sort of this conversation feeding into policy, and OSTP has been very active in that, Tom and his co colleague, Megan Smith, and others. So on Mars, you want the same thing you want for everybody on Earth. You want clean water, uh, renewable electricity, and uh, access to information for everyone. I think this you look at Mars as a great laboratory for what it's like to live in an extremely constrained environment. You're constrained by energy, by resources, uh, by the need not to pollute your environment. Uh, it's a great lesson learned for all of us. And, and maybe this is your point, right? The geoengineering that could arise from just living the right way on Mars can teach us a lot about the Earth. But it'd be one of many spin-offs we would get from, uh, from going to Mars. I'm all for it. So there was a guy here, yeah, uh, yes, sir. No, 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 a guy behind you, sorry. Uh, stand up, come on, go for it. My question is this, so if we're planning on colonizing Mars, we have the moon that's sitting right there. Why, why aren't we trying to figure out a multi-year habitat for people that's completely self-sustaining to use it as a laboratory before we're on a multi-year mission to Mars? Yeah, I think a Andy did a good job with that. It's the feedstocks that that they're, they're, Mars is much better equipped with the feedstocks for you know, my twenty parts. We can't source all of them on the Moon, as far as we know, but we can on Mars. Raft Ernke, a mid twentieth century visionary rocket scientist guy, uh, said that if God had meant men to explore space, he would have given us a Moon. Um, and that's about right. It is the obvious stepping stone to lots of uh, the futures that we're contemplating. Um, it might be uh, the efficient way to stage missions to asteroids to Mars. There are alternatives, though. It's also been proposed as the, the basis for, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but a sort of a space economy. This may be where uh, those uh, space companies are headquartered, simply because it's the obvious place from which to send resources back to the Earth or bring them into space. Um, but that's a bit in the future, right? And so how do you think we could get, create a hydrogen economy in space? You know, water is everywhere, it turns out, right? We've already established it's really all over Mars. It's not hard to find on Mars, it's possible. It's actually on the moon as well. Uh, we found it in many places on the moon. Uh, it, just like Earth, uh, and it, this shouldn't surprise you, there is water often enough across the solar system that it seems like the obvious choice for uh, the resources that'll matter for sustaining human life through drinking water and food, providing radiation protection, water is actually a very good radiation shield, um, and also rocket fuel. You take uh, water, separate it into its oxygen and hydrogen constituents, and you have rocket fuel. That's the space shuttle rocket fuel. In fact, at Cornell University, we've been building that technology. We've got a rocket motor now that runs on water. And we're planning to send that to the moon in a few years. So uh, we take seriously this possibility that all you need is water. Um, that might be enough. Also, there's environmental impacts to rocket launches, burning kerosene. Be great to have all hydrogens. But we have, uh, we have a question over here, is that right? Stand up, let them hear you outside. Uh, we're here today discussing this all within the context of the, the Martian. So my curiosity is, how do we facilitate the production of these amazing technologies? Using could, science fiction to enable these technologies. Could, could I say two things? Uh, um, yes. Thank, thank, thank you. <laughs> Start with the first one. So the, the first one was... <laughs> The first one was, for me, a good microcosm is when um, William Shatner was writing his book, he came to visit my lab, just as part of scouting, and we had this amazing moment where we couldn't tell who was copying who. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was copying Star Trek or if was sort of Star Trek was copying science, and to me, that is the point. <laughs> but that's the first point. The second one, um, let me, Janet Zucker's in the audience, along with I don't know who else from the Science Entertainment Exchange. The background to that is, a, a few years ago, I, um, I was advising Hollywood science movies, and, but then the National Academy asked about advising science communication, and they went to a meeting, an all-day meeting on DC on the pamphlets they were gonna print. And at the end of it, I said, you must be joking. Um, and what grew out of that in a bunch of steps is the National Academy has an office in Hollywood for science, and what, what came out from some exploratory meetings was the movie makers who were talking to a friend of a friend said, gasp, you mean the scientists would actually talk to us directly? 
And the scientists who were talking to a friend of a friend said, sort of gasp, the movie makers would talk to us. And it turns out all that was missing was something in between to facilitate that. And what's, what I find so interesting about this office is The Martian is great as a science story, but a lot of what it does is hijack popular media. So you don't even realize you're learning about science, it's backstory. It's well, that's what's great about it. Don't, it says, Andy, you wrote, or the Mark Watney says, uh, uh, don't worry, I've done the math for you. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, and, and so I'd, I'd highlight I know, that. I know really women nice... that have a crush on Mark Watney. <laughs> Not Matt Damon, you with me? So, on the fictional character. So, the, so I think the real power is not simply you should learn science, but hijacking popular media in just the way this office does to plant science. So the question is, how, how can we get uh, more of our storytellers interested in what are the implications of you know, CRISPR and a space economy and exponential manufacturing? I guess we'll have a meeting at uh, here, <laughs> Century City, and uh, everybody will get inspired. It's a cool, it's really a fantastic thing. It's this um, trying to bring this technology to everyone in the world, these ideas, this way of thinking, is, uh, is uh, what we all have in common, I think. So how are we doing on time? We're done? OK, we got to take one last question. Come on, we're done. OK, this is like a little drama. So this over here, this is it. This better be just great. <laughs> no pressure. As a father of two girls, how do I get this? This may be more directed for you. How do I get them to be up there with you? How does he get his two daughters to be you, Alicia? I'll, I'll give you. Um, um, geez. I mean, I really got inspired by Arthur C. Clarke's books. That's what I read when I was a little kid. I read tons of science fiction. I read Isaac Asimov, and that vision. That and nobody ever telling me that that wasn't girly to like any of those things was really what propelled me. I mean, that's why I get out of bed every morning is because I want to create a different world. Um, and science and technology gave me the tools to be able to do that, and I'm incredibly thankful. So, a quick statistic for you: um, you know, at Cornell University, we have a mechanical and aerospace engineering department. You would think that it's uh, male dominated, like the industry is. A lot of white guys doing this stuff, right? Well, you know. <laughs> It turns out uh, this year is the first year where we have exactly uh, gender parity in our incoming class of undergraduates. So that tide is turning. So one of the things that President Obama has said, if you win the Super Bowl or the NCAA, you get to come to the White House. And he said the same thing should be true if you win a science competition or a robotics competition. So every year he does uh, a, a science fair at the White House, and one of the things that uh, Dean Kamen has said, who, who started FIRST Robotics, has said, in a free society, you get what you celebrate. So uh, that is just a, f you nailed it. Great last question. <laughs> just remind your daughters that half of the humans are girls and women, and science is the best idea humans have ever had, so let's have half the scientists and engineers be women. Let's go, people. We can do this. Let's change the world. Thank you all very much.